Retro video games are getting way too expensive. What was once stumbling into a flea market and picking up a soggy box of various Sega Saturn games for a fiver has turned into the search for a deal that won't break the bank. Growing up, I could find copies of Earthbound laying around for 20, maybe 30 bucks. These days? Nope, not even close. The market for retro games has eclipsed the point of no return for casual play, and if you're wanting to play, say, any classic Pokemon title, you've got three options options. Pay up, pull out a loan and pay up, or click a few mystery links and get it running on emulation, which I'm obviously doing because there's no dimension where I'm throwing down this much for a copy of Persona 2. Nearly a thousand for a boxed copy of Mega Man X3? I think I'll pick up the HD collection and not spend, you know, a month's rent. But it ain't just the good and popular games. As we all know, any one of these can appreciate and blow up in value for whatever reason. And as y'all are aware, some of them are bizarre. $150 for the the Educational Dentist Simulator Rex Ronin Experimental Surgeon? Surely this information is still relevant. If you're sick and need medicine, take medicine that isn't yours. So yo, it's Austin, and today, once again, we're gonna be diving into the relentless and ever-growing world of expensive and rare video games. <laughs> Not paying for all of them, of course. I don't think there's uh, many jobs out there where you can justify buying a boxed copy of Pocky and Rocky 2. At that point, you're just being silly. Although, I guess I am dumb enough to buy one of these on a whim. It's a, it's a problem. We've got a lot we need to get into today, but before we get started, I need to talk about today's sponsor and something I've actually used for a while now, Soylent. You've seen the memes, you've probably heard or made the joke, hey, isn't that people, but no, this is Soylent. Soylent is a complete nutrition brand with a science-based take on health and wellness. It's fully plant-based, packing 20 grams of protein, and has been dubbed the world's most perfect food. That ain't just me, that's science. A while ago, I used to be a lot bigger, and during my personal weight loss journey, Soylent was a pretty decent part of that. Back then, it was just a powder, but nowadays there's the whole peanut gallery of options and flavors, including some with caffeine. I usually like to grab a variety pack so I could try a different flavor every now and then, but recently I've been enjoying the mint shot chocolate flavor, which is technically Soylent Green, but yeah, plants. Soylent's a good way to get just the right amount of nutrients at an affordable price without any cleanup. That's average two to four dollars a serving, which if you look around, is pretty hard to beat right now. So Soylent's teamed up with us to get y'all a special deal. If you click the link down in the description or use the code, you'll be able to save a decent amount off your first box today. Click the link down in the description and thanks to Soylent for the sponsor. Now, let's talk about some video games, rare ones to be specific. But what makes a game valuable, besides, you know, supply and demand, obviously? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think any of these had the intent of rolling into the new century and costing somebody an arm and a leg. And some of them only become rarities when a brand new game in the series gets announced, which is exactly what happened with Armored Core. I loved this game as a kid. It's hard to say no to anything that allows you to pilot a giant mech, especially when it gave you a mix of strategy and customization to tackle. From Software's long-running franchise is one that I played every other entry of growing up, and despite its now aged clunkiness, it's still a great time. The premise was simple. The Great Destruction wiped out a majority of humanity, people became survivors, and then slowly corporation-sponsored mercenaries, specifically ravens, doing anything for the right price. You unlock and buy parts to upgrade your AC, you tackle missions to get money, and slowly make your way up the best pilot charts. The original Armored Core absolutely feels and looks dated in the 2020s, but it also holds up in a way that only a classic PlayStation 1 game can. It just also decided to balloon in price dramatically over the last two years. Prior to the pandemic, you could find a copy of this one sitting around for like 20 bucks, no problem, for years. Then, the second the extremely good Fires of Rubicon got an announced, boom, we're in the triple digits. Now take what I just said and do it for almost every game in the entire series. If you're interested in a boxed copy of 90% of these, you'll be shelling out a stupid amount. The PlayStation 1 titles definitely have it worst, although it seems like anyone craving some fast-paced mecha action is gonna just pick up six. And I don't blame ya, it's extremely good. Now, for the price of nearly three armored cores, you could also snatch you a box physical of Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle. Doesn't this have a remake? 
remake? Yep, wow. two of them. It's even got a sequel on the PlayStation 2. However, none of those remakes or ports have ever come close to really feeling like the PlayStation 1 original. Prior to fusing with Bandai, Namco really wanted a piece of that 90s mascot pie after Pac-Man was losing his grip, and Klonoa was, in my opinion, a fantastic attempt. Klonoa uses a mix of 2.5D platforming that's rendered in a multi-directional 3D setting. You've also only got two buttons to use here, jump and your ring. You can use that to grab onto dudes, use them as a jumping platform, or throw them into other objects. It's incredibly simple to the point where you might wonder, well, where's the beef? It's just that the meat is in the overall vibe. The levels gradually get more difficult, but not too much. There's collectibles in each stage and phantomillions to rescue. Truthfully, it's not very long at all. You can have everything done in about five hours or so, which is dreadfully short for the modern price. It's like, what, $60 an hour? Sure. Door to Phantom Isle actually has a decent story with a presentation that may be outdated, but it works. All of the characters are technically voiced, none of which comes out in a decipherable language, and despite being clearly targeted for the kiddos, it's held up. Bit of a tearjerker of an ending, too. I love the way that the 3D models look. Look, look at Gaddius here. This is a JRPG villain if I've ever seen one. Despite reviewing well, unfortunately, it wasn't too hot in the sales charts here in the States. I think that's likely because the North American PlayStation audience was already deep in the wacky extreme 90s. I do think that this would have had a totally different reputation if it had released on the Nintendo 64 back in the day. At the very least, it and the wildly expensive spin-offs, oh my god, are now considered cult hits. Even some of the best platformers from the era. The remake is still a decent experience, but I've always thought that it was an uncanny reflection of the original. The only way to play this one legit without yoinking it off the internet is to pull out the old PS3 and pick up the PS1 classic before that inevitably gets taken down. Though, maybe you should. is great. Kicking it back in time a bit, let's head on over to the Sega CD. Now here's a console filled with some rarities. The Sega slash Mega CD may not have been a huge hit in the West, but it did manage to put out a few bangers, some of which have stood the test of time. Your Lunar 1 and 2s, Wolf Child, and anyone who's playing Robo Aleste knows they're playing greatness. Then you've got something that's been a rare, sought after, and pricey as far back as I can remember. Around the same time as the birth of Metal Gear, we'd also see Hideo Kojima's Snatcher. The original Japanese PC release of this may be from the 80s, but the only time it actually came stateside was in 1995 on the Sega CD, and never again. Which is a shame, because Snatcher was absolutely a cult classic. Visual novel point-and-click adventure games have never really been on the forefront of the mainstream. Despite their quality, your Monkey Islands, Grim Fandangos, Broken Swords, and King's Quests were never the type of game to sell multi-million copies. That is, unless your name was missed, which was a huge deal. Over in Japan, the visual novel genre was, and still is, popping off, but even so, something like Snatcher failed to become commercially successful. That's crazy to me, because Snatcher is a standout. You could tell Kojima was on an 80s sci-fi kick with this one, as environments and the world pull a lot from Blade Runner, Akira, and other cyberpunk media like Bubblegum Crisis. There's not much to talk about beyond the narrative, considering it's, well, literally the entire experience, but Snatcher's heavy M rating and colorful cast of characters are something that demand a revisit. And they did, with a Japanese-only PlayStation 1 and Saturn port the next year. Not for me, I guess. The only way to experience this legit in the West is through a Sega CD copy, which is not only censored in multiple ways, but will also run you an easy breezy $900 for a complete copy. Yeah, okay. Don't forget to pick up one of them Konami justifiers for another 50 for the shooting sections, and you're nearly four figures in the hole for a visual novel. I mean, it is cool, but yeah. I love the 90s voice acting, though. Get out! And I thought you were such a gentleman. Welcome to Outer Heaven. Table for one? Is that a flippin' Metal Gear reference? Speaking of consoles that are notoriously expensive, how about the Sega Saturn? Yeah, there's like a ridiculous amount of games that are in triple digit territory. Last time we went a little into Magic Knight Ray Earth, which is such a banger to me, but today we've got one of the best things on the console, Burning Rangers. <laughs> It's 
definitely an acquired taste. Burning Rangers is a bonkers concept tossed together into a fast-paced arcade setting where you play as the most late 90s thing possible. By that, I mean a futuristic group of super anime firefighters known as the Burning Rangers. There's a decent amount of characters to unlock, but you start controlling one of two, Sho Amabane or Tillis. Since this is a bit more arcadey, it doesn't drastically change anything, but there is different dialogue depending on who you pick. You just gotta be ready for some classic video game voice acting. This is great! Chris, um, it's okay if I ride on his back for a while, right? Please? Okay, but only if I can get to ride first. Burning Rangers was one of those non-Sonic Sonic Team releases, most of which could go either way with the quality. It had an all-star group of developers on it, including pre-punished Yuji Naka and amazing character designs by Naoto Oshima, the uh, Balance Squad. The music here is definitely the shining star. Whenever it fully kicks in, the vibes are immaculate. That is, when you're not having an argument with the controls. I don't think Burning Rangers feels terrible, but it certainly isn't as good as you would hope. The Saturn controller, even the 3D one, doesn't help too much with the tight corridor design of the levels. Plus, navigation is done mostly with in-game audio cues from your captain, which is honestly a neat mechanic. They just might lead you astray from time to time. I will say that this thing pushes the Sega Saturn to the very edge of its limitations. I feel like the console is going to have a meltdown and explode. You might need to call the Burning Rangers. You can feel and see the game loading in all the geometry as you're playing it. It's just not enough to really detract from how much fun it is in execution. Burning Rangers is designed to be played a lot, as it'll track your stats and has that classic Sega design of trial and error speed runs. A fire will explode from the walls with backdrafts trying to impede your progress, and you're even given a rank at the end of a mission. I just think that maybe four levels in total is a bit too short. You can nail this thing out in two to three hours in your first go, and in 1998, that was excessively quick. Nowadays, if you want to pick up a physical box copy, it'll run you well over 600 bucks, which, unless you're really, really into it, just isn't worth the price of entry. At least it emulates well. Burning Rangers is an amazing idea that has yet to be revisited, and that's a little depressing. It gave us a glimpse into this fascinating world, a killer soundtrack, a silly concept that they went 100% in on, and a cast of fun characters. I'm just glad the others are unlockable. The second I saw someone named Big Landman, I knew that was my guy. Whatever Sega's doing with their new Sega Ages Super Game or whatever, they need to bring this one back. No buts. I don't want to hear them. Nice work, guys. In my opinion, those are classic. Games that may not be super obscure, but definitely left a mark when they came out. None of them really have the popularity of like Pokemon, but they're all still very much worth playing by any means. Which brings me to my next section, one that I have named simply, uh, I have literally never heard of this. I think that gets the point across. Time to whip out the 3DO. The most advanced home gaming system in the universe. It's time to put away your toys. Ah, the 3DO. I never knew you? The fourth and fifth generations of video game consoles had several releases that went entirely under the radar. Also, consoles clearly, as the 3DO really hasn't had a long-lasting impact. You could file it right next to the CDI. Decent tech for the time, but the games didn't quite hit the finish line. Regardless, around 250 games released on this bad boy, and with that relative obscurity, you can bet a whole bunch of exclusive, weird ideas can only be found for a hefty price. The holy grail, of course, being a boxed copy of Dino Park Tycoon, a port of a mech DOS sim. Just a worse version of it in every way, since you control the mouse with a controller. It's fine. What I really want to bring up is Lucien's Quest, a Japanese RPG. No, this isn't a joke. From the looks of it, the 3DO had a mild presence overseas, with several Japanese exclusives hitting the platform. Whip out that copy of Pretty Soldier's Taylor Moon S and pull off combos with one of these. Lucien's Quest. Also known as Sword and Sorcery over in Japan, is a classic RPG with a generic story. You take control of a um, Lucienne as she embarks on a quest after being stuck in her master's tower. You get a party, you do mage stuff, and try to help people and eventually the world, probably. It's got this interesting battle system where attacks are done in lines and you can hide behind others to not take damage. You can interact with the environment for shielding as well as throwing things too. Though looking through the footage, you can see the main issue. Lucienne's quest runs like 
ass. It's rocking a solid 10 to 15 frames a second the entire time. And like Burning Rangers, you can see the entire world falling apart on the edges of the screen. There's a neat feature where you can have alternate camera angles, but the stretchy scaling pixels meshed onto these tilted 3D backgrounds is more confusing than anything else. I think Lucien's Quest fails from a technical standpoint 100%. The Japanese only Sega Saturn version does run a bit better. It actually shows character portraits and dialogue, the combat sprites are more detailed, and it's overall the better product. Even so, it can't quite escape the frame rate dimension. Grabbing one of these on Panasonic's console box is gonna run you a pricey 6 hundo, 400 loose for one heck of a spelt box art. Just remember, anytime during your quest that you're exploring an amazingly realistic world. Keeping it with swords and sorcery, have you ever played Incantation? If not, I don't blame you. It was a late Super Nintendo title developed by Titus France that put you in control of a little wizard guy. This little blonde kid, or a brunette in game? On the box he looks totally different too, but all three iterations of him look like they'd say terrible things to you on Xbox Live. So yeah, you're gay. Incantation didn't review well at all, which kind of makes sense considering the developer would go on to create Superman 64. <laughs> this isn't that bad though. It's actually got a little in common with Gunstar Heroes of all things. You've got little spells that you can sling about that'll change depending on your pickups, some objectively worse than others. Unfortunately, you can't avoid them, so if you touch them, your precious spell will disappear in an instant. It's a real cute concept that starts off promising, but it quickly becomes evident that they didn't know what to do with the level design. It's a classic case of get every item to exit the level, but that'll reset anytime you die, which is very easy to do. The stages are also open-ended, so you might spend a lot of time looking for the small feather icon, only to fall into a pit and have to restart and collect all three again. It seems like it would be a good time from a distance, but no, not really. More frustrating than anything. Anyways, if you want a copy of Incantation, a game I'd never heard of until this week, you'd better be prepared to throw down 200 just for a cartridge alone. Nothing like spending half a grand on a stinker. You can also do that with Moon Ranger for the original NES. Oh, it's been a hot minute since I've experienced platforming this bad. I guess that makes sense though, considering this was one of those unlicensed games for the console. Yeah, back when the Nintendo seal of quality meant the bare minimum. Odyssey Software's Moon Ranger manages to encapsulate pain in cartridge form. You play as this schmuck as you alternate between two gameplay styles, space shooting and platforming, both of which feel like the worst of their respective genres. Not much to see here, just an ugly baby blue cart and a $500 price tag. You know what? We can spend more. Arrow Fighters for the Super Nintendo, a console port of an arcade classic, probably the most expensive thing on the platform. Get out that checkbook, cause we're spending over 3,000 in box today. Arrow Fighters, also known overseas as Sonic Wings, is actually a good game though. This one's the first of several games to hit multiple platforms, mostly on your Neo Geos. It's got a thumping Super Nintendo soundtrack, solid controls, and the exact amount of length and stage variety that you'd want in one of these. Unfortunately, it got, at least in my opinion, unfairly ripped apart by reviews that didn't really get classic shmups. That and the original had a longer vertical screen while this was crammed into a more traditional box. A lot of people behind games like this left to form Psycho, which ruled the shoot 'em up genre for an entire decade. I think the original Super Nintendo version is totally worth playing, just uh, not for $3,000. I don't want to be around anymore. The only other game I would have for like, I have never heard of this, would be physical copies of The Last Guy. Like, it's Japanese only, the game is new enough and just kind of okay, but those things are going for two to three hundred dollars, which is crazy. For now, I want to move into the realm of familiar IPs, cartoons, movies, you know it. Typically, your licensed stuff is only inches away from the bargain bin, but ever so often a game will come out that has like a low print run or something and becomes rare because of that. For example, Jungle Book Rhythm and Groove. Uh, sorry. Jungle Book Rhythm and Groove Dance Bundle. Yeah, that little ugly DDR pad ripoff and box cost this game to shoot up from less than $10 to a full 250 plus. It's not even a cool looking pad. The box is only showing me stock drawings of it. They must have put no effort into it. Just children staring directly up at you knowing they asked for Dance Dance Revolution and you got them this instead. I'm not really sure who this game is for, so let's talk about the Flintstones Surprise at Dinosaur Peak. You know 
who made good games, Taito. They may not be as prevalent these days, but in the 80s, they were slinging out arcade classics and random cult hits left and right. Am I just a sucker for Lufia too? Absolutely. But also, Flintstones Surprise at Dinosaur Peak is a decent time. It certainly beats the Master System, Fred must paint the wall. You take control of both Fred and Barney, who actually have different movesets. Barney can move across ropes, while Fred can climb up ledges, a rarity in the NES days, although this did come out all the way in 1993, which uh, kind of explains a lot. We've got a bunch of stage variety, there's surfing levels, minecarts, and uh, <laughs> whatever this is. It's not the best platformer out there, although it certainly has a lot of charm. And also, NES difficulty. <laughs> This one's actually a sequel to an older title, The Rescue of Dino and Hoppy, which by itself goes for a decent amount. Now, surprise at Dinosaur Peak? A loose cart will run you nearly 1400 with a complete in-box swinging for the fences at over $3,000. Or, you know, and check this out. A whopping 170 kilobytes. <laughs> You know what deserves a better reputation? Duck Dodgers starring Daffy Duck. Uh, sorry. Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century! This original Looney Tunes short that was a parody of the period popular Buck Rogers in the 25th century somehow ended up spawning a random Nintendo 64 video game nearly 50 years later. This was before the standalone cartoon, too. Well, Paradigm Entertainment teamed up with Infograms to bring us, in my opinion, a bit of a hidden gem. Certain magazines crushed this one when it released in 2000, and I think it's a lot better than that. You just gotta deal with a bit of wonky fifth generation camera. You control, obviously, Duck Dodgers as you play through multiple stages across different planets, searching for Marvin the Martian. Despite having older visuals on the crunchy old Nintendo 64, I feel like they were able to recreate that Looney Tunes feeling with aesthetics and level design. You want Acme? Oh, you'll get Acme. Pure, out of control, wildly destructive Acme. It's little touches like this that make it stand out. Duck Dodgers is a clear step behind some of the best 3D platformers on the Nintendo 64, but it's also a lot better than I think it gets credit for. It just also happens to be more expensive than all of them too, with box copies going for $290. It's rare that a licensed game will reach those prices, but leave it to the Nintendo 64 to make it happen. In other instances, a release will be identical on multiple platforms and be absurdly more pricey on another. For example, Samurai Jack Shadow of Aku, a more normal $30 to $50 on the PlayStation 2 and a crazy $140 on the GameCube. Weirdly published by Sega, they teamed up with Cartoon Network to put out a game on the popular show from the time. One that didn't review well. Shadow of Aku really wanted to resemble the highly stylish show, but failed to deliver. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay lacks the oomph that you would expect, and even the slow motion Sakai mode just ends up being a filter on the screen as opposed to anything cool. At this at this point, multiple Devil May Cries have made an impact in action games, and this decided to go a more simplistic button mashy route. One that doesn't feel great either. That and a lot of the worlds just kinda look the same the entire way through. With something as stylish as Samurai Jack, you definitely wanted to put a little more effort into that. I don't know how the Game Boy Advance title replicated the style more accurately, but it is what it is. It looks like the more recent Samurai Jack title got middle of the road review scores too. I think these should have been a shoe in. Are you here to save our friends? What has happened to your friends? Aku forces them to play video games that rot their brains into mush. Video games? One last licensed game today, and it's one that I actually own because I'm kind of a freak. You're not escaping the Marvel superheroes today. X-Men Children of the Atom. I love X-Men. That should be obvious at this point. If anyone ever wants to sit down and talk about Marauders or Helians, I'm in. X-Men Children of the Atom is a fantastic Capcom made fighting game from the early 90s that's held up. It doesn't quite hit the highs of say, X-Men vs Street Fighter as that's one of the greatest of all time in conversation, but we wouldn't have the entire Marvel vs Capcom series if it wasn't for this very good 2D fighter. This originally came out for the arcades as well as the Sega Saturn in the mid 90s with a pretty dang good port that's actually affordable. However, I guess the decision was made to also bring it to the PlayStation 1 in 1998, and instead of letting Capcom handle it, Acclaim published it with Probe Entertainment in charge of the port, leading to 
easily the worst version of a very, very good game. I hope you like loading screens all the time. The PlayStation 1 version of Children of the Atom is filled with all kinds of slowdowns. Some of the animation frames were removed to make it work, and it's bizarre to me that they failed to make a game from 1994 run well, especially when Capcom pushed out MVC1 a year later. Granted, that was also the worst version of Marvel vs. Capcom, so I guess these early 2D fighters were just a little too fast-paced and beefy for the 32-bit behemoth. Nonetheless, even if you're notoriously the worst version of a game, that PlayStation 1 collector bonus will have you going for well over $100 complete in box. Same story with MVC 1 and 2, all fantastic fighters going for a pretty penny no matter the platform. But hey, a uh, quick reminder that the Dreamcast covered the second one features Psylocke and Guile, no one else, and that's pretty awesome. This era of Capcom fighters was, and still is, my favorite. Take a X-Men Children of the Atom is a pretty freaking cool game that everyone should play despite those prices, but it's not like the good version of the game is attainable by normal means anyway, so uh... Thanks, Fightcade. While we're at it, let's talk about a couple other really cool games that also aren't cheap. I'm sure anyone familiar with retro video game prices is very well aware of the TurboGrafx-16. When the cheapest game on the console is still in the double digits, you know you've got yourself a pricey collection. Granted, that's got nothing on Magical Chase. Developed by Quest, the people behind Tactics Ogre, my favorite, Magical Chase is a fast-paced side-scrolling shmup. Yeah, it turns out a lot of these have high values in the States. Yeah, it just might not be expected. <laughs> $8,000 complete! According to eBay listings, these ones aren't moving too frequently, which makes sense considering the sheer numbers we're looking at. Despite all that, Magical Chase is actually a pretty fun time. It follows in the same footsteps as Gradius in the Cotton series, where you play as a magical witch girl shooting oodles and oodles of everything. There's little stops that you make along the way to buy upgrades and power-ups as opposed to picking them up, and the directional lock-on system provides a good bit of challenge. There are much better shmups before and after this, so Magical Chase isn't like some legendary game of yesterday, but it is a pretty cool experience. However, if we're equating dollar value to game length, considering you can beat this in half an hour, you're looking at $16,000 an hour. That sounds reasonable, huh? The TurboGrafx-6 team is home to a lot of unique experiences, kind of like the 3DO, except a higher standard of quality across the board. If you owned a PC engine, TurboGrafx, or were just sentient in the early 90s, you probably heard about Bonk. Sega had Sonic, Nintendo had Mario, NEC Home Electronics had Bonk, a caveman, one who uses his head to, well, bonk things to death. Mario used his grippers, Bonk would bonk. For some reason, he didn't really catch on, though if you wanted to play some Bonk, you had a ton of options. He wasn't even TurboGrafx exclusive. Bonk's adventure made its way onto the NES, Game Boy, Super Nintendo, and even the GameCube. If you want to own a single game of this franchise, though, be prepared to shell out a boatload of money for any of them. Seriously, I think the only franchise that rivals the average price wall might be Pokemon. So, Bonk 3, Bonk's Big Adventure. That's right, we got Bonk twice in the title. This thing hit the TurboGrafx-16 and the CD attachment they released and resells for upwards of $1,200 boxed. It's also pretty good. The whole series has a 7 to 8 out of 10 level of quality, and having one of these on the CD just allows the fun music to sing even louder. The game has a bit of a slower pace, but the process of using your noggin to literally crush everything in sight is fun. Any game that'll let me climb walls with my teeth is great. How's about Ribbit King? Frolf! This is what happens when you combine golfing with living animals. Hit the frog, watch the frog go. Try to rack up as many points as possible and get yourself in the hole. This used to be an affordable game and technically still is on the PlayStation 2, but once again, that GameCube tax struck it hard, making a loose copy a little expensive. This is a great one to play with friends who also like obnoxious cute things, or hitting cute things with big hammers. Yay, violence! And now for our last game of the day and something that's easily the pure opposite of Ribbit King, something that's held up in quality over the years as well as price. I kind of forgot to mention it in my Celebrity and Games video, but it is worth talking about. Def Jam Fight for New York. A fight, when it takes all. And the loser. The loser? Hell, I don't know. 
Loser goes to Jersey. <laughs> oh yeah, it's time. Def Jam Fight for New York is an awesome game. At the time, I didn't really get it because all I knew was World of Warcraft, but now as a grown man, I can boot this up and I get it. Def Jam Fight for New York is the sequel to Vendetta, a well-received fighting game that combined hip hop and celebrities into a ridiculous experience. Technically, more on the wrestling side because it was developed by Aki Corp, responsible for WWF No Mercy and all the other best wrestling games back in the day. Fight for New York is absolutely the perfected version of this. It's faster, more brutal, has way more characters, a longer campaign, more all of the things. It's also a little less wrestling and more of a brawler. You've got multiple fighting styles you can pick from, all of which play differently. Although no matter what, the goal of each battle is the same, knock out your opponent. The environments are a big part of each battle, and when you get into the free-for-all action, it gets a little nutty. Fill up that momentum meter, get a ridiculous zoom in on your face, and do some over-the-top attacks. If you've ever played a fighting game, you know how this works. Fight for New York is just a really solid one of those. It just also happens to have a full-length campaign featuring the likes of Method Man, Henry Rollins, Carmen Electra, Body Count Ice-T, and of course, Snoop Dogg, and so many more. I think part of the charm is that it takes itself 100% seriously. You get to customize your own character to fight with in a system that puts together a little art piece for you to make before being showed a model that looks kind of correct. I tried to make me, but it didn't really work. Plus, I'm not this buff. I don't think I'll ever be. It's hilarious watching your dude in cutscenes, though. Well, if it ain't America's most wanted, that police composite don't do justice to your ugly face. <laughs> Shut your mouth. The gameplay feels great. It falls somewhere between strategic and chaotic as you're attempting to pull off these over-the-top moves on dudes large enough to make an official meat madness match. There's not a moment I'm playing Fight for New York where I'm bored or not enjoying myself and the plethora of unlockables means I'll be there even longer. And I guess a lot of people felt that way too because this thing has steadily gone up in price to where a boxed copy is getting close to $200 on the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and nearly $100 on the Xbox here in the States. That's crazy, but I'd assume there's a ton of nostalgia over here for this. It's got a fantastic, memorable soundtrack, tons of personality, a well-made campaign, a ridiculous amount of stuff to unlock, and endless hours of multiplayer fun to be had. It's unfortunate that the sequel, Def Jam Icon, failed to live up to that. It really sucks to say that something like Def Jam Fight for New York is now probably something you'll ever own unless you already did, because it did sell well. It had a greatest hits release, but that kind of quality and demand makes it a hot commodity that I don't think people are really wanting to get rid of. I will say, if you've never played this story, grab a few friends and have yourself a campaign playthrough. It's absurd and like watching an All the Warriors anime moment just with Ludacris instead of Goku. So there you have it, even more rare and expensive video games that you'll probably never own unless you already did, in which case I'm just saying things. I feel pretty lucky to have held on to my copies of games like Sweet It In or X-Men Children of the Atom for all these years. These things just keep raising up in prices. I mean, I hate that they're worth so much that it prevents normal people from playing old school games, but I'll definitely do my best to take care of something like this. Unless there's disc rot, in which case I'm screwed. What's the most rare and expensive game that you own? I know. Someone in the comments is gonna be like, I got four copies of Pokemon Box, and like, you know, share the wealth, homie. You can put down a payment on a car with that thing. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up, check out the sponsor, or if you wanna support me directly, head on over to my Patreon or buy a t-shirt over at the Pixel Empire. I put everything y'all provide back into the channel, and I hope that every single one of y'all is enjoying what you're seeing. For now, I'm gonna head back to the 100% dimension. I've got a few things I'm cooking up that I hope y'all enjoy. So, I've been Austin, and catch me next time when I talk about something a little different AKA, I don't have any ideas because I'm just, I'm gonna go play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth right now. I'm not doing a video on it, I'm just gonna play it. Bye. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Kwolek, Benna Oswald, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, Dylan Snyder, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Idlevice, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Karen Arter, Rare Find It, Ryan Talbert, and Vox. Thank you all so much for your generous support. Oh, well, that was a quick turnaround, but hey, we do what we gotta do. I actually love looking at these rare games because it allows me to look into stuff that's at this point really obscure.
obscure, and well, I hope y'all like it too. Just as an update, I'm still working on both Forspoken and Suicide Squad. I'm just waiting for some extra content to come out. And hey, since I just moved, you know, it takes some takes a minute. For real though, I'm not I'm not gonna do a video on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I just want to play it and like think about it. That'd be cool. Just a little one for me. Anyway, drink some water, brush your teeth, and I'll catch you guys next time. Bye bye.